Right, thank you. Uh, it's quite an honour to get to give the very last talk of this meeting. So I'd like to thank the organisers for that opportunity and also more generally for the wonderful meeting we've, we've had this week. Um, so thank, thank you. Right, so what, what I'm going to talk about is um, essentially work stemming from an observation and the observation is that random variables, as considered in probability theory, naturally <coughs> form a sheaf. And so there's that observation, which I'm going to begin the talk with. But having made that observation, it's natural to look at that sheaf within the context of um, a category of probability sheaves and look at some other constructions that exist in that category and see what they have to do with probability theory. So that's roughly how the talk is going to go. Um, so probability theory is one of the areas of mathematics that has been little touched upon this week. We've had connections with many areas of mathematics, but not so much with probability theory. So I'm going to remind you what a, a random variable is. So a random variable is simply a a map x from a sample space omega to some nice space of values a where for my talk I'm going to look at well-behaved random variables where well-behaved means that omega and a are nice spaces and x is a nice map. Um, so specifically, I'm going to assume that, so omega, the sample space, this, this has to be a probability space to, to do probability theory at all. So I'm going to assume that it is, um, it's given by a Polish space. So that's, a topological space um, whose topology is given by a complete separable metric space structure. Um, but we're just interested in the topology. In fact, we're not really interested in the topology because I'm going to consider it then with the lattice of Borel sets. So it's given by a Polish space with a Borel probability measure. P omega. And the value space A I'm going to likewise assume is a nice space which again I mean a, a Polish space. Um, and I'm going to consider the sigma algebra, this space together with the sigma algebra of Borel sets. And x is a Borel measurable function, so inverse image preserves Borel sets. So I'm going to drop Borel in future when I talk about measurable. So in probability theory, one often considers somewhat more general definitions for the general theory. But when you look at uh, many books on probability theory, almost all the good examples fit into this setting. So it's not a significant, the, these kind of well-behaviedness restrictions are not such a significant restriction from the viewpoint of probability theorists. Another thing that I'm going to do, which is not always done, I'm going to identify random variables mod zero, which means modulo almost everywhere equality. Um, probability theorists tend to not identify them modulo zero, but still 
the re relationship of almost everywhere equality is, is, is very important in probability theory. Um, so this is a random variable, but as in my abstract I mentioned a blog posting of, of Tao's, um, which was some introduction to probability theory in which he says, well, yeah, this is all very well, but it's a very concrete definition. If we say this is a random variable, we can, we can state all sorts of um, nonsense properties about it that don't make any sense for, um, from the viewpoint of probability theory. Like you could say, is an element here hit by some particular chosen element of the sample space? That's not a probabilistic meaningful statement. And Tao observes that or proposes that the notion of probabilistic meaningful statement should mean some property that's preserved by extension of probability space. And what extension, of, preserved by extension of the probability space, it means that one should consider random variables as being a pre-sheaf over a category of sample spaces. So I'm going to introduce now the category of sample spaces I'm going to be working with. And this is not quite the same category that Tau uses, but it's better behaved for my purposes. Um, so the category P of sample spaces, P for probability spaces, but um, so the objects are Polish probability spaces as above, and the maps are me measurable, Borel measurable, measure preserving functions again identified mod zero. And then it's easy to see, I think I've got, yeah, it's, it's easy to see that random variables, so for any, for any Polish space, space A, we have a, a pre sheaf um, RVA, so a pre sheaf on P of random variables. So, namely, RVA at, at, at the sample space omega is just the random variables from um, omega to A. So by random variables, I'm implying already this identification mod zero, which is important because to get the re-indexing working. So obviously re-indexing is by um, composition here. Okay, so the first observation or the, the, the starting observation is that um, this pre-sheaf of random variables is actually a sheaf, and it's a sheaf for what is going to turn out to be a growth and topology, but I'm going to verify it's a growth and topology later. I'm going to put that aside. Um, but it will be the atomic topology, which means that every map in the category P is going to be considered that just the singleton map itself is going to be considered as a cover. So I want to now state the main lemma that is used to see that random variables are a sheaf with respect to this family of covers that I will later show is a topology. Um, is it bad form to run a lemma across two boards? Um, maybe it is, so let's... Let's start a new board here.
So I'm going, so in a sense, this is a, an observation, but I'm going to do this observation in some detail because there are some technicalities to it um, that maybe could be, could be avoided, I, I don't know. But anyway, this is, this is the way I see it. So, so the observation is going to be, the lemma is going to be the sheaf property. And it's going to be just about the pre-sheaf of random variables valued in the reals in the first instance. So, um, so it's the following, given um, a map Well, actually, so I was using a sort of epi symbol there. Um, this is just an arbitrary map in the sample spaces. In fact, every map in the category of sample spaces is, is epimorphic. Um, so given a map in P and an, an, a Y in random variables, a real valued random variable um, on omega, Pull the blackboard a bit down, please, again, so we can see the definition of the... Oh, sorry, is this... No, the, the other one. Ah, oh. right. Well, sorry, sorry, which one? Yeah. Um, so now you get the shadow here. So, um, let's put it... Let me write it like this. So actually... It occurred to me just before the talk that this might be the first ever talk in a topos theory conference where <laughs> omega is a sample space in, <laughs> in um, a probability space rather than the subobject classifier. Never mind. I, I want to keep my notation the same as, as in my notes here. So, so given this, the following are equivalent. Oh, T, F, A, E. The following are equivalent. So, firstly, y is what I'm going to call invariant, which means matching, in the usual sense of a matching family for a sheaf, um, relative to, let's call this r. So the term, for atomic topologies, the terminology, the definition of matching family works absolutely fine, but the definition matching always feels a bit awkward to me because for a family to be matching, you imagine there have to be several components to it to match each other. And here there's just one component that has to behave well with respect to the single map R. So I, so I prefer to use invariant, but I mean the same thing as matching family. So, so what this means is, in other words, for all maps um, q, q prime into omega to parallel pairs of maps like this if um, r composed with q equals r composed with q prime. So if they essentially intuitively land in the same fibers over r, then they re-index y to the same thing. So y Q, I'm just going to write this for the re-indexing. So Y, Q, omega prime. Put, sorry? So Y is from omega prime, so from omega prime. Y should be from omega prime, yes, thank you. Sorry, that might have been confusing earlier. So indeed, we've got a family up here, <laughs> so a random variable up here that's supposed to be sort of invariant with respect to R. Um, so this is equivalent to a Right, can I push this up now, or does it still need to be there? You have been yours off, like, Sorry? You have been yours well, I know, but I want to complete the... The whole point of not starting there was to fit the thing on one board, so... Is that okay to push this up now? Just... I'm sorry about this, I didn't... Right, so the second property... So in a sense, we're saying that Y is somehow invariant on 
fibers over Q intuitively. So in fact, this has a probabilistic statement, which is that Y is almost surely, surely constant on almost every fiber of Q. And what this means, this uses the concept of regular conditional probability, which exists because we're working in a nice category of probability spaces. But how, um, what's the, what is the relation of, I mean, what are the morphisms here? Because you work with things with, with a probability measure or with, so then you, you work with maps modulo, Maps with spectrum measures. So the sample spaces carry probability measures. And Q and Q prime respect the and, and the And the maps in the category of sample spaces preserve measure. But the random variables themselves, there's no, we're not, we don't, we don't have a prob chosen probability measure here. So these are just Borel measurable so functions. Almost everywhere in the first condition. Yeah. Because yeah. Yes. Um, so what this means is, so we have, we're using here the regular conditional probabilities, which I'm not going to define, give the full definition, but I'll just give the intuition, which is we've got the map um, here from omega prime to, to omega. And so we can view this, we've got sort of omega down here and we've got omega prime up here, we might have a little point here, which has the fiber p to the minus one of omega up here. And the regular conditional prob probabilities say we have um, for almost, almost all omega in, in, in the base, um, a probability measure, Borel, but it doesn't, probability measure P, which I'll write like this, a con sort of conditional probability measure. Um, so R equals omega can, on the fiber P to the minus one of omega. And these work in such a way that you can get for any Borel set S up here, you can get the probability of that space by integrating the conditional probabilities here over by varying the omega down here. So for any, for any Borel S in, um, which is a subset of omega prime, then the probability up here, which I'll call P prime of S, is the integral over the omegas downstairs of the conditional probability measures um, on that fiber, all integrated with respect to the, the measure downstairs, which I'll call P. Okay, so that's the intuition here. Using this, we can state the property of Y being almost surely constant on, on every, almost every fiber of Q. And a third equivalent now, and this is the reason for me taking it valued in R, is that the conditional expectation Your P, is it not an R? It's strange, it should be R minus yeah, one. Oh, this is an R, uh, oh, yes. Sorry. So I, I had P in my notes, but then I thought when I write on the board, my little P is going to get confused with my big P because I don't write so carefully. So I changed it to R, but then I'm now running into problems from that. So <laughs> um, anyway, so the conditional expectation of X given R, ranges over the base space. So this exists, which is that this is a measurable function from omega to R. This exists. There's a little issue here that normally conditional expectation is defined assuming that um, X is integrable here. It need not be integrable, but it doesn't matter. Using regular conditional probabilities, you can make sense of 
conditional expectation more generally in this setting. I don't want to go into such niggles. In any case, it exists. And um, if, we, if we take that conditional expectation, Oops, and we re-index it along R, then this equals X almost surely, but that's. Um, so that's the lemma. And this conditional expectation is, so this is the map from omega to R that gives us the random variable, which is going to be the amalgamation. Again, amalgamation is not a, uh, really, it's like a descent property, really, because we've just got the one map, but we're, um, so it's, anyway, it's the desired gluing of... Is that your X or uh, Y? Ah, uh, yes, the X is Y, sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. That's... And the, on the, last, uh, the last formula, you mean you compose it on the right by R? So, it's a composition. this is a composition which is also re-indexing in the pre-sheaf. Um, so the consequences of this is for every, for every Polish space, A, R, V, A is a sheaf. And also for every sample space, Polish sample space, omega, y of omega so the is a sheaf so so when we've shown that the ad, atomic covers form a topology the topology will be subcanonical but in fact they're therefore canonical because it's a, it's an atomic topology um, so these follow because uh, every polish space embeds in the real numbers so that's that's quite easy but we needed to use the real numbers here to, to use the argument by conditional expectation. Right, so we've got the sheaf property. Um, so I, don't, I, don't, I didn't really pay attention to what time I started, and I know we're running late anyway, so... Um, we have, uh, uh, seven minutes, eight, eight minutes. And then questions. Seven minutes and then... Eight minutes and, the, and then questions. Yes, okay. Sorry, but here's one question just quickly. So it means particular that not every sheaf comes from random variables. Is that so random variables? Who are, ah, no, I see. No, no, okay. No, no, no. Well, ev for every Polish space A, you have a pre-sheaf of, of A-valued random variables, and that is always a sheaf. <laughs> That's, that's all it means. So, what I was trying to ask was, are all sheaves on your side random variables with respect to some border space? No, of course not. I mean, they're going to, because we're going to have a whole sheaf top box of things and they're going to be random variables over Polish. There's no way they're going to form something like a. What's y omega? Sorry? What's the last statement? What's y omega? Uh, y of omega is the inader applied to, it's the representable of, the representable pre sheaf generated by the. Um, generated by the sample space omega. Right, so I, I had high ambitions for the rest of the talk. Um, I didn't realise how slow I am on the backboard and, how, and uh, how dangerous it was to depart from one's own notation. Um, so, so maybe I shall just give a very high-level summary of what I was going to say. So, so firstly, that um, well, we have the condition that means that the atomic topology is a topology. Um, so, actually, maybe this is the m more important thing to go into a little bit more detail, but I'm not going to say as much as I intended to. So we identify. Well, we no. We'll we'll say we say that a square um, a commuting square in P. Um, so the problem with using omega for everything is you have to put a lot of dashes. But um, so let's have R R prime um, Q prime Q 
or something like that. Um, we say that it's a, a, an independent square if, so we can consider, th so these are measure preserving maps between sample spaces, but we can consider them as random variables in their own right. So if those two variables, so Q and Q and Q prime as random variables are independent conditionally on the composite random variable down to the bottom. So let's call that RQ. So this is conditional independence that I'm not going to have time to define, but it's a well-known concept in probability theory. So this, I say that's an independent square. And the proposition is, um, for every co-span, let's keep it the same as, as above. There is, is a universal um, independent completion. By which I mean we have R and R prime, and over it they can complete to a to an independent square. Well, let's call this omega prime tensor omega double prime sub omega. So it's kind of like a pullback, but it enjoys the pullback property just with respect to conditional, just, just with respect to independent squares. But nevertheless, that characterizes this up to isomorphism. Um, so essentially, this is constructed as a, as a pullback um, in the category of, po I mean, it's a bit fiddly, really. It's actually quite a fiddly construction. And you need to take fiber-wise products of regular conditional probabilities up here in order to get the the measure on this space, sort of integrating it all over the conditioning space. But anyway, there is such a construction. One can find it in, also in the literature, though it's quite hidden. I've never seen this universal property mentioned before, but it's, that's just really uh, an observation. Um, in which book you mentioned? Sorry? In which book you mentioned, which book you mentioned for that property? For this property, there, it's, it's in a paper by somebody called Ernst Erich Dubakat from about 11 years ago, which is, um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, and the same property is considered in Fremlin's book on measure theory, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually have the existence result for Polish spaces there, but he's, got, but he's discussing sort of general properties of this construction. Anyway, it's a nice construction, and it gives us the property that every co-span completes to a square, commuting square, the something or a property, I always forget, left or right or what have you people call it, but anyway, it implies that the, the, the atomic topology really is a growth in topology. Um, but moreover, we've got this in a really nice way. And that really nice way, I mean, we have the completion in a sort of universal sense. And that, that really nice universal sense was going to give me a general Cohen construction. So we've now got the category of sheaves over the samples sheaves over, over P, um, and there was going to be a general con construction on this as a co-end, which um, gives a monad M that has the following prop so it's just defined purely category theoretically, but it has the following property that um, M of random of the sheaf of random variables of A is isomorphic to random variables in the space M of A, where this is the 
Giri monad of um, of uh, well that assigns a to, so m m of a is is the Polish space of Borel probability measures, which has a nice Polish space measures on A. So we recover, in a sense, the Giri monad in the sheaf category via just a general Cohen construction that I, I'm afraid time is, is running out because I want to just say something about where I want to go with this. So I didn't. So, so my point is that sheaves of P, I think, is a nice category of sheaves within which so probability concepts, probabilistic concepts live. So we've already seen so random variables. We've seen um, probability spaces. That's the representables. We've seen a, a monad, a monad of um, probability measures in a sense. There's a. There's also a. An equivalence relation, well, actually, between on any object of the topos, it's defined, which is just identifying those elements that reside within the same atom in the lattice of subobjects. So this exists always for an atomic topos. It has nice properties. In this case, it coincides with equidistribution of random variables. So we've got an equivalence relation of equidistribution. It's a general property in the internal logic of an atomic topos that if you have a subsheaf of, of, say, of RVA here, then for all x, y in RVA, if they're equivalent and they, one of them satisfies the property, then the other one satisfies the property too. So this says, in a sense, any definable property in the topos of random variables is invariant under equidistribution of, of, of random variables. So that's a nice, it's saying we can only state probabilistic things, probabilistically meaningful concepts in the topos in some, in some sense. Definable is important here. If we start sticking free variables in, morally speaking, then, then, then that property is going to go. So this has to be a subsheaf. Uh, sorry, the, the property needs to be a subsheaf. Um, it's Boolean, of course, because it's an atomic topos. Um, but no, that doesn't satisfy the axiom of choice. But it does satisfy, we do have dependent choice. And the proof of this uses, so the proof of this is basically uses Kamolgorov's, Komogorov's extension theorem. There's a liquid, the Solovey model, where every uh, subset of L is measurable if we have not axiom of choice, but just a dependent choice. Um, it's very different from the Solovey model. Um, so, yes, as, so, I mean, like it, we have we don't have axiom of choice, but we do have dependent choice. But this doesn't satisfy that every set is every subset of reals is measurable. This is doing a it's in quite a different direction because somehow the important thing here. This is like in David Roberts' talk. He mentioned the permutation models. This is very like those in that you have um, the, these these the random variables will not live in the cumulative hierarchy of sets. So they they're basically random variables in this topos are somehow atoms. So what I think all this stuff together actually suggests using the internal classical logic of this 
theory to do probability theory with random variable as a primitive concept. And actually, I mean, I thought of this as a kind of pipe dream when I was playing with this topos, but I've been thinking about it more and it, it actually seems to go quite a long way. So I've developed it to, to some extent and I'm really quite excited by what's coming out. Well, moderately excited, let, let's say. So anyway, it is, it is kind of, it is, it does seem that, that anyway, it'd be interesting to do, so an interesting setting for probability ther theory. And there's some, um, probability theory, question mark. Um, and this connects with this other paper I cite in my abstract. So in the, this um, volume of millennium mathematic visionary papers, um, there's a, an article that's cited in the abstract. There's an article by David Mumford there um, in which he's saying it would be really nice to have an approach to probability theory in which we do probability theory with random variables as a primitive concept. So, so my idea is that this topos should actually provide a model for that kind of endeavor, um, but working out the details is, is future work. So thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have one question. Uh, you mentioned a reference for this, uh, the existence of the product here, in fact. That this you don't catch the name of it, yes. Right, well, so, I mean, it, so it, it seems to me like a fundamental... Fredlin, Fredlin. You mentioned the textbook by Fredlin. Yeah, yeah, so it, it seems to me like a, quite a fundamental property, but it's curiously absent in the probability literature. Um, so in, in Fremlin's measure theory, um, if you look at... Maybe he calls them relative products. He has a, a, a too concrete definition of what a relative product should be with some statements about they don't exist in general and some existence results, but none of which are exactly what I need. Um, so the same property was actually needed in computer science of all places, which is where I where I came from, so I'm aware of somehow the computer science literature. And again, it's not quite in exactly the same form, but the, I mean, there's a bit of history there, but the, the nicest exposition in computer science is a paper by Dubberkat, Ernst Eric Dubberkat. Um, I don't remember if there's an R in there or not, um, which I can, I don't remember the title. It's from the early, maybe from 2004. And again, he's working in a sort of different setting motivated by computer science applications. And the result I need more or less, but not exactly, is found somewhere in some remarks there. But there's some history to that that actually, I mean, the construction is not terribly difficult when you have the right results about it. Yeah, are you just saying that almost for every fiber you take the product probability space and then you just integrate this yeah. over yeah. omega? This is just the naive. Yeah. So up to analysis question problems, it is clear what you do. So the question is to add some conditions to do the analysis. It is indeed, but you need to have it working with the Polish space structure up here, which itself is not easily found because these are measurable maps, not continuous maps. So we're taking a pullback of Polish spaces using measurable maps between them, but then one can still, one can actually refine the Polish. Just one of the so-called standard Borel spaces. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because of the commutative for algebra. Well, so, so in fact, one would, the whole, so I should have said at the start, the whole choice of category, in fact, um, so I wouldn't want to work, standard Borel spaces are the ones in which, in which the, Borel, the Borel sets are in bijection with the standard lattice of, of the, 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 sorry, the measurable sets are in bijection with the, the standard canonical lattice of Borel sets. I do want to have the point measures and things like that in here, but I mean, actually a, a very natural category to work with is the category of um, what are called standard probability spaces here, which, which 
embeds this category, but in fact is equivalent because of the identifying maps up to almost almost every very quality. The property is that uh, with, with, uh, when you have a measurable map, you can always discarding a null set yes. and reduce it to a, a, a disjoint, countable union of compact metrizable space in such a way that your map becomes continuous. Right. This so, is classical yes. property <laughs> of measurables. Right, so, th so that, that also might help with this property, but, but in fact this, this, this sort of pullback thing can be constructed just directly using the, the, the structure of, of the, so even without using properties like that, you can just directly use the countable presentation of the sigma algebra structure on the, on the well, uh, really yes, so yeah. But, the, but, 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 yeah. But, but in fact, one point I should have made at the start was that, that as soon as you identify maps up to almost everywhere equality, so very many different categories coincide with this one. So it's a very canonical. So it's also it's the it's the category of um, it's it's also the category of countably presented measure algebras opposited. So that's a nice thing. Can work also the yeah, measure algebra. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yes. It's yeah. not a question, but just a, a remark from the point of view of teaching probability, which is something that I've done a little bit. It's already, it will be very difficult to teach, I think. I, I like it a lot, but it, to, because usually we have measure theory at the beginning, yes. and then after a point we tell the students, yes, we have an omega somewhere, but we won't really look at it. We, just, we compute expectations and yeah. so on. Yeah. And sometimes I have to remind the students that when you define a stopping time, there is an omega hidden somewhere, a small yes. omega. Yeah. And sometimes very good students will ask, but can you give us an example of one small omega in a, a computation of t of small omega? And I say, no, we never look at this. We have the omega, in a, <laughs> yeah. big omega in a corner, and we forget about it uh, after a point. And that, here you have lots of, basically, because they're all the possible yeah. omegas. Yeah. I think it will be, it's quite a change of point of view. I think yes. it's very so, nice. But so, but actually the omegas are just here in the, construction of the category theoretic properties. The point is, once you do this, there are no omegas. This is, so, no omegas at all, <laughs> neither big nor small. So this is actually one of the, one of the nice, I think one of the nice features of this approach. The idea is to, to basically use this to, together with the calculus of independence, of conditional independence on it, and... Um, so you need to the omega at the beginning to prove that this category exists. So. Well, in a sense you can, but the other, otherwise you can work axiomatically and, and just, so, that, so that's the Do you know what the axioms might be? Like, can we characterize all the random variables as certain objects in that topos? You said they're almost the atoms, is that what you said? Because that's what, I guess that's what the question is after. You, you would say, let's just go to this topos and our random variables are such and such. Well, the random variables are, are, are not the atoms. Um, so... So, I mean, my idea is that you wouldn't characterize them, you would add the, uh, the, the idea of where you would, you would add the object of random variables as a new set in set theory. Um, and then, so, so you would say, so you'd say sort of, let me have a random variable X and for any random variable and any other random variable, you, you can find another one that's equivalent to the second independent of the first and, and this sort of thing. So there'll be these kind of conditions that, will fit together with dependent choice to allow you to do, to do more elaborate. I mean, it's that kind of, it's that kind of reasoning, but we're going maybe a bit off topic here, but that's... What was yeah. this uh, equivalent, this uh, sub-object of RVA, RVA cross RVA? Well, you can just think of it as the sub-object of pairs of, of random variables. So at omega, you've got random variables from, you've got functions from omega to A, and you're equating those pairs of, of such functions that are equidistributed, so that in, equidistributed, so induce the same probability law on A. On, on, on A, so it's an equivalence. So, so on random variables, X is, is related to Y. If, if the probability law of X on, on A is the same as the probability law of y on a, so the probability measures they induce are equal. But the point is, it is actually, it is just the, it is just the instance of a general equivalence relation that exists because this is an atomic topos. It exists for any atomic topos. 
so it's a, this equivalence, there is an equivalence relation that exists for all objects. On, on, every, on every object, you have, this, you have an equivalence relation due to the fact that we've got an atomic topos. If you have an atomic topos, you have such an equivalence relation. And it just so happens that in the case of random variables, it is a very meaningful thing. <laughs> So, so what is the general thing for an atomic topos? Um, so you have a shape in an atomic topos, and then well, I mean, so so we've got so we've got a sheaf f, and we've and we've we've got let's see, we've got x, y in f times f at omega, and you can. So one way of saying this is that this is, so this, this holds if and only if there exists um, Q, so there exists some omega prime, and there exists Q and Q prime from omega prime to omega, such that Q, so, so that X re-indexed under Q is Y re-indexed un, re under Q prime. But also, it amounts to it amounts to, we look at the subobject lattice of F, and it's atomic, and we're, put, we're sticking X and Y in the equivalence relation if and only if they're in the same atom in, the, in this atomic, in the subobject lattice. But of course, here you have to assume something, because omega prime empty is a. Is a no. Both empty, no. Media primes and the sorry, empty is probably the spaces here. Uh, yeah, the, sorry, this, um, this, this can't be empty. There's, yes, the prob the, they're all probability spaces. There's got to be. So what, are you working in the top or in the side? Side. In the side. So, yeah, this is in the side. This is two elements of the sheaves externally <laughs> are in the equivalence relation. I'm defining the, I'm defining the equivalence relation as a sub, well, it's a, it is a subsheaf anyway of F times F. Okay, so you consider, so if you want to work with the topos, you consider the site of atomic guys in the yeah. top of something yes. like this. Mm -hmm. And do this condition there. Okay. Well, okay. I'm not too sure about <laughs> that. I mean, I am. <laughs> really. okay. but I mean, intrinsically, can you describe what you do in uh, invariant terms? I mean, Sorry? Uh, can you describe uh, this in invariant terms uh, without using the site? I mean, maybe you speak like... Uh, in... I'm not sure. Uh, um, no, I mean, you said uh, in every atomic topos. Uh, well, okay, but... So, omega is an arbitrary object in, this, in the... In the cat I'm not using the particular site. Omega is just an arbitrary object in the category that we're forming the atomic topos over. So, this is... This, this is no, no, but here yeah. it is not a good definition because you can take omega prime to be empty, so I suppose... No, omega prime no, no. is an atom. No, but I suppose that you take for that... No, so there, is, there is no... Em there's no empty probability space. Okay. No, but you, are well, you said that it makes sense in an atomic topos. Yes, it does. If you've got an initial object in, in the category and you put, put the atomic topology on, then you, get, then you get something... You just get the category of sets. Two prime are covers, are covers in this case. They can, omega prime cannot be empty. So atomic, atomic topologies are very trivial in categories that have initial objects. I, I thought you supposed that all maps in this side are APs anyway, right? I don't. Well, in my case, I don't suppose it. It just. It just is the case. That all <laughs> that's, that's not necessary for atomic sites. Okay. It's not necessary for an atomic site, but if if you're going to get if if you if it's, if you if you want the topology to be subcanonical, then they better all be epis. Okay. So. Okay. Yes. okay I, yeah. This this looks very cool, and I'm very curious whether you thought of some calculus based just on primitive <laughs> concepts of random variable and independence where you could maybe like derive like central limit or strong or strong law of large numbers or something uh, but I'm uh, really interested in this uh, moment so <laughs> the space structure on the space of world probability measures I mean what's like uh, if, if A is like the bare space what's the dense uh, set of probability measures on that. So the dense set. Of yeah, because the polish space needs to be separable, right? So 
Yeah, but the, the, the space of probability measures on a Polish space is itself a Polish space. Yes, that's so that's what I wonder, what is the... So this is a theorem. Yeah, so this is... The natural topology for yeah. which... Yeah, yeah, you put... Yeah, you, you put the weak topology, or the vague topology, as it's sometimes called, on the space of Borel probability measures. And indeed, it's a theorem that if you start off with a Polish space, you get a Polish space back. And you can, fi you can find that one in many textbooks on probability theory and measure theory. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yes? Uh, so you said probability theorists don't like to mod by null sets when defining the maps. Yes. Uh, and category theorists don't like to take quotients either because you lose too much Yes. So could yes. you not do that but instead say a two cell between measurable maps is a null set outside of which they agree and do some higher topos version of this? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's an actual higher thing to do there. So to avoid the modding by null to begin with, one can use the, the measure algebra presentation instead, in which case that automatically does that for you. So that, actually, that's a much nicer way of presenting it, but maybe not to... You could probably do von Neumann, suitably well-chosen von Neumann. Yeah. Um, yes, so, I mean, what I use the fact that I mod by zero to get the sheaf property because the conditional expectation is not defined otherwise. I don't know if it's crude. I mean, I've, I feel that something would fall down if I didn't mod by zero. But whether there's another way of doing it by bringing in higher category theory, I don't know. And personally, I, I'm not going to look at that. So, <laughs> um, yeah? So do you have any clue on whether this topos has a point or not? Ah, excellent question. So, um, so I actually had a, a conversation last year with Olivia in Lumini in which I conjectured that the topos has no points and she was very skeptical and rightly so. And um, <laughs> this, this meeting, I've, I've been spending most of the meeting trying to calculate what the points are. And so, so I, have, I have a conjecture. <laughs> but not a, not a result. And if anyone would like to work with me on this conjecture, I'd, I'd be very happy to have a collaborator. So, I mean, one strength of the conjecture is that, um, so this is a, this topos is actually kind of a countably distributive topos in the sense that there's a distributivity property between countable limits and co-limits. And in that context, it's natural to look at inverse uh, geometric morphisms that have the stronger property that inverse image functors preserve countable limits. Um, and I believe that the points that have that stronger property are exactly the non-separable, non-atomic measure algebras. I believe there's also a point which is the separable, the unique separable non-atomic measure algebra, which is not a point that preserves countable limits. I don't know if there are other points either, but I mean, my conjecture is that those two, that. This other one is a, so basically non-atomic measure algebras are points, I believe. We only need to find one point for this kind of process. If you then want to then exhibit it as a category of um, continuous G actions, for example. Um, yeah, maybe you could try a logical analysis uh, <laughs> that could help maybe finding the points. I mean, to, to start from theory of pre shift type and then uh, that would be homogeneous models for that. Well, that was... That was how I got the conjecture about the, um, <laughs> the countable limit preserving bonds. But, but yeah. Yeah? Uh, I have a slightly naive question about how random variables and probability spaces would look like internally. I mean, you, you kind of touched it, as, uh, but, but um, I, I still don't have the picture on, on how they would like. Uh, if you have a statement like x, let x be a real value random variable, how would you interpret that internally? Well, so I would have real valued random variable as a basic thing in my, in my internal language. So I would just say let x be in that. But there'll, there'll of course be a relation between that and, and nice subsets of, of the space. So, so you're going to have, um, well, a has probability relation between random variables and, the, and good subsets of the of the of the space A, um, and there are go going to be some other things too. 
and also so so this conjecture about points so the the model in the in this topos is of random variables of the two element set which is internally to this topos one way of looking at it it is a um, so random variables of two carries the structure of a, a non-separable non-atomic measure algebra here so so that's some internal structure that exists there just so it's uh -huh.